Welcome to Artist and Critic. I'm Don Gray. I thought we'd try something a little different this time. Uh, usually, as you're well aware, we have uh, guests on the show, but I really have been wanting to do a series of programs concerning the uh, problem of contemporary art. I, if you have been looking at the various programs that we've had, you will realize that I have a feeling that all's not well in contemporary art. I think we're faced with a number of problems. I, I think the artists, the majority of them, have lost contact with reality. I think they have uh, devoted the majority of their energies toward manipulation of the materials with no uh, other meaning besides that, the uh, art for art's sake, I suppose you would say. Uh, but tonight, I thought we'd like to focus on a uh, particular aspect of modern art, a particularly disturbing aspect, uh, the depersonalization of modern art, or in a more specific sense, we could describe it as the mechanization of art. Uh, we can go to our first picture, and uh, as we'll see, it's a picture by Ellsworth Kelly, called Red, Yellow, Blue, Orange, Green, something of that sort. It's uh, Blue is the first color that you see, green, yellow, orange. Then it ends with a red rectangle. Uh, huge picture. Uh, each color panel approximately uh, four feet square. Uh, and to me, it epitomizes the depersonalization, the mechanization of modern art, the turning it into a uh, rectangle. and. Uh, unabashed rectangle, no other elaboration, simply the uh, uh, cold, impersonal kind of picture. Uh, when we go to the next one, we see a picture by Barnett Newman, uh, one of the 12 stations of the cross. Now, frankly, if art has to have any kind of quality, it seems to me that it has to have some kind of spiritual emotional power, something to grip the viewer. I simply can't believe that great art will survive, that survives the centuries, and we can, whether we're talking about Vermeer, Rembrandt, Caravaggio, Da Vinci, Titian, uh, Uccello, who in the early Renaissance was very design conscious and very aesthetic conscious. Uh, those paintings cannot survive through the ages without some kind of a passion, some kind of feeling, some sense of probing by the artist, some sense of profundity, you know, beyond mere superficial qualities. And when I see a picture like this by Barnett Newman, approximately six feet high, uh, consisting simply of stripes, some smooth, some rough, and of course, modern aestheticians will make a great hue and cry about the little roughness on the right there. It looks like it's bleeding out into the white segment of the picture. Uh, when I see this picture as a station of the cross, and I try to think of it as uh, reflecting some of the passion of Christ or any human being in a situation uh, marching to his death, martyred by the powers that be, the establishment, I, it, I simply don't believe that it reaches that level of art. It's, it's simply decoration based on the rectangle again. If we go to the next picture by uh, Andy Warhol, of course, Andy Warhol is very well known, and uh, in society, uh, the social pages, as much as the art pages, and uh, an underground movie maker who has uh, become extremely fashionable. We look at his green Coke bottles. Again, a, another large picture, uh, not really a painting, but a silk screen on canvas. Now, to give this picture its due, by the repetition of the Coke bottles, it expresses some of the, uh, uh, how, can, how can we say it, the standardization of our age, where different products are stamped out of molds, whether they be cars, Coke bottles, Brillo boxes, Campbell's soup cans, uh, or people. You know, this is the age when we put people into slots we, we live in this mass society where it is very difficult to be an individual, and uh, we tend to lose sight. We're losing sight of the human being, I think, in society, and I think that's one of the problems, one of the reasons that we're losing sight of them in art. 
so that it suggests a certain amount of conformity, a certain amount of standardization, popping out the products rather meaninglessly. But when you look at the picture, it doesn't have any structure in terms of solidity. It's more an illustration of the Coke bottles rather than a painterly uh, rendition of them. So it becomes artificial. It's artificial because it's silk screen. If I can say something just rather boldly, the silk screen is the most impersonal artistic medium. Of, and we can say certainly of the print media, but it is involved in it uh, more of the, uh, you know, there are more preliminary steps and cuttings of stencils and so forth that it, it, you, the artist really doesn't end up with a very personalized product. Okay, let's go to the next picture. Another pop artist, uh, Roy Lichtenstein. And we see a picture called uh, Big Painting. And it is big, approximately six feet square again. Uh, and we look at a large brush stroke in the stylized pop art style that Lichtenstein is known for. Of course, he works with cartoons, has worked with cartoons. He's moving more recently into a uh, large, simple, pseudo-cubist kind of style. Um, the brush stroke, the living uh, essence of a painting, is the brush stroke of a great painting, whether Vermeer, Rembrandt, Cezanne, uh, Van Gogh, uh, you name it, name the artist, is the direct essence of the artist's being. It, when the artist becomes mature and expressive and developed, the great artists, his inner being, his inner soul, if you will, his deepest inner thoughts are communicated through his brushwork. It, this vibrant, living thing that lives and throbs throughout the centuries. You know, so that we will admire the brushwork of a, a Titian, uh, you know, three or four hundred years after they were painted, more like 450 years. Um, what has Lichtenstein done with the brush stroke, this living essence of art? He has calcified it. He has mechanized it. He has stylized it. He has controlled it. He has deadened it, in a sense. In a sense, Lichtenstein is presenting here in this one picture the entombment of much of contemporary painting, the sense of overstylization, the sense of increasing rigidity. Moving to the next piece, we have a uh, sculpture by John Chamberlain. And the subject matter, it's, uh, a, I'm sure you're very familiar with John Chamberlain's sculpture, uh, made from crushed automobile parts welded together. Uh, you know, this piece done in the 1960s. Uh, Chamberlain, in essence, I suppose, is an expressionist artist, one who deals, uh, he, he welds, he puts his fenders and his bumpers together in an emotional way. You know, they aren't rigid, they aren't static the way Barnett Newman's pictures are. But here we have uh, really sort of the essence of our modern society with the emphasis on high technology. The uh, building of cars by Detroit, of course, is one of the foundations of our economy. Uh, we're urged to buy the cars, and uh, too often they fail to meet our needs for romance, uh, sensual passion, and <laughs> bringing us that magical girl who appears in the commercials, you know, she leaves her scarf behind. Uh, not too often does that happen, but what happens is what Chamberlain is presenting to us. The dump, you know, the car enters the dump, it's crushed, it falls apart, and we have here in Chamberlain's work witness of the debris of modern uh, culture, in a sense. You know, the debris of this uh, economy that pumps out the standardized uh, Coke bottles, as we saw in Warhol, the Plymouths, the Chevrolets, the Dodges, and so forth, and they end on the, the junk heap. So Chamberlain is using his sculpture in really quite an expressive way to, su to suggest this sense of waste and, and the exudation of a technological society. How did we get there? How did this all begin? How did we reach a point where in our own time, in the 20th century really, uh, we have been dominated by, uh, <laughs> uh, by technology? Never in the history of the world really has industry 
and technology reached such a high level. Had, it, it's had the power to uh, change society, to move people uh, geographically, certainly, uh, from cottage. We've heard of the phrase cottage industries. Well, there are very few of those now. We, we are factory people. We are the recipients of objects made by factory people in factories by this high technology. It has dominated our lives. Frankly, I think in many instances on the negative side of it, uh, of course, we aren't going to argue that technology hasn't been helpful in, in many respects. And we're really quite pleased that uh, medical advances are made and that there are uh, labor-saving devices so that we are allowed more time to probe into our, our psyches and into our uh, minds and so forth to perhaps understand more about life, more about ourselves. Uh, we don't have to ride a prairie schooner across this vast continent spending all our energies simply on survival, you know, thanks to our high technology. Although on the negative side, perhaps we have to try to survive our high technology. Perhaps it has depersonalized our existence terribly. So compartmentalizing us, separating us from each other, you know, that has been one of the reasons the automobile has been often condemned because uh, it separates us from other people, it separates us from our environment, you know, it really in a sense is like a rolling uh, tomb <laughs> uh, to uh, perhaps overstate it, over dramatize it. Um, we have lost, certainly lost contact with nature and the land. The ecology movement recently has brought us back, uh, trying to bring us back, fighting the effects of technology and so forth. But it, this overweening uh, depersonalization brought about by technology, brought about by the wars, World War I and II, have had profound effects on art and upon our life. And I think the problem with modern art, the point I'm talking about this at all, is that simply by echoing the problems of society, the depersonalization, the mechanization, the tendency to uh, underestimate the power of the of the individual, the value of the individual, uh, that's dangerous. That's dangerous when art simply reflects the negative aspects of society. So where did this all start? Let's take a look at the next picture, a painting by uh, Paul Cezanne, of all people, one of the great painters of the 19th century. If we had to name a pivotal painter of that time, pivotal in terms of his influence on the 20th century, it would have to be Paul Cezanne. We'll look at one, one of his pictures tonight. I'm sure mo most of you are quite familiar with his work. This is entitled View of Lestoc, uh, a bay in France. The vast central flat part is blue water in the foreground, the buildings in the distance, the mountains. Now what does Cezanne have to do with the modern technology and the depersonalization and dehumanization of art? Well, uh, he's obviously looking for structure. We look at the foreground buildings, we look at the sharp, simple edges. Just take the, the front, the central taller building with the chimney, the simple roof, one simple broad side in darkness, the other side in light. It becomes almost cubical as he looks for the simple, basic shape. You know, the sharp edges to the roof lines, the sharp edges to the bay as it goes along. Even in the distance, the mountains, there are a sense of plains and Contrary to Impressionist painting at the time, for example, Monet, if you contrast this with Monet, Monet will be hazy, soft, very atmospheric. You wouldn't even see the mountains. You might not even see the bay. Uh, so that this sense of structure, this sense of hardness of, and harshness in Cezanne is going to s somehow coincide with the modern spirit in the artists and in mankind in humanity and is going to lead to a cold, impersonal art. Cezanne's was not an impersonal art. If we look at this picture, we sense that he is interested in what he's painting. He's interested in the fact that it is a house, that there are trees, chimneys, uh, the sea, the sky, mountains, and so forth. Uh, but he is very interested in this structure. We will look at structure in some later pictures and we'll see that uh, they have none of Cezanne's feeling for the visual world, and it's about this point that modern art begins to go astray. Okay, uh, 
in our next picture, we'll see uh, the immediate influence of Cezanne on uh, the artist George Brock, a fellow Frenchman. Uh, when Cezanne became well known, after years of hardship, years of poverty, years, well, he was, didn't, years of poverty because his father uh, had a considerable fortune from the hat business, I believe. He wanted Cezanne to go into the hat business. And uh, aren't we glad that Cezanne didn't do that? But uh, George Brock's picture houses at Le Stock, at the same place, the same town. Brock goes to study some of Cezanne's effects. And, uh, and what does he do with the, with the houses? Look at, that's what those uh, cubes are in the lower part of the picture, the central part of the picture, and moving up onto the right. But look how he's moving a step away from Cezanne. He's becoming more abstract. They become cubes for their own sake, more than the fact that they are houses. There's a tree moving through the, the left corner of the picture that adds to this sense of geometric structure. But it's in pictures like this, uh, I'm not demeaning Brock's accomplishment. I think it's a strong painting, but it is becoming uh, rather depersonalized. It is becoming ge geometricized. And uh, there's a passion, the way Brock has put it together. It's kind of a stormy picture uh, and a dynamic picture for all its uh, cubist uh, structure but we're moving away from nature here. Going to the next picture, we have uh, the well-known picture by Pablo Picasso, the uh, Demoiselles d'Avignon, the young ladies of Avignon. Uh, often called the first cubist picture, uh, this painting painted before Brock's uh, picture that we just saw, quite large in the Museum of Modern Art, about six feet square or so, approximately. Uh, What has Picasso done to the people? You know, what is the feeling in Picasso's handling of the picture, handling of the figures, that ties in with our discussion? You know, we'll talk about uh, critics and artists, we'll talk about Picasso being influenced by Cezanne, as he was, and that's why there is this crisp, structural, sharp, hard effect to the picture. He was influenced by primitive uh, sculpture, uh, as suggested in African masks, as South Seas masks, and so forth, and you can easily see the effect on the faces in the picture. Uh, but very few people talk about this picture as representing man's fate, if you will, in the 20th century, becoming tortured, uh, twisted, dehumanized, uh, losing his sense of of cohesive structure and form. Now, I'm not criticizing the picture. I'm just, I, I think it's an effective picture. It's a dynamic picture. It's a powerful picture. Uh, hopefully, we'd be able to say that even if it wasn't an extremely historic picture. And everyone uh, aware of art is aware of this painting. But what is happening is we're saying the effect of the 20th century on modern man through the eyes of the artist who was perhaps more in tune with his time than many people are. You know, this is pre-World War I, painted in 1906, 1907, and there's a certain sense of, of the dying of, the, of an age at that time, but there's also a certain sense of well-being. People are saying, well, it's, things will get better you know, something the way things are now. P people say things are going to get better. Uh, the economy is going to pick up. Uh, we aren't going to run out of our natural resources. We aren't going to cut down all our trees. We aren't going to pave the continent. You know, things are going to get better. Uh, but Picasso sees this tension coming into society. Moving to the next picture by Picasso, painted in 1910, we see an uh, analytical cubist portrait of the art dealer uh, Daniel Henry Henri, I suppose you would call it, Conweiler, very well-known uh, art dealer at the time. Uh, his face, if you're having difficulty picking it up, is in the upper right middle of the picture. Uh, in the analytical cubist period, which Picasso and Brock explore jointly, 
they are looking for a new art. They are destroying all of the past traditional elements of art from, you know, if you think of order, balance, harmony, all of these things, they're looking for a new dynamic art expressive of the 20th century. And by God, they find it in Cubism. And Cubism, influenced by Cezanne, influenced uh, most of the works that we saw at the beginning, particularly Ellsworth Kelly and Barnett Newman. But here we have, aside from the aesthetic qualities of Cubism, we have the fragmenting, the faceting, the destruction of the human being. And because the faceting is done in a geometric way, I, I feel in no way is it too, are we stretching it too far to say that we are looking at the effect on mankind of modern technology, modern industry, the modern way of life, the 20th century strident, rush, 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 produce, produce uh, quality that uh, tears us all apart. You know, why are you on biofeedback, my friend? Why are you going to, uh, why are you studying transcendental meditation? Uh, why are you reading books on how to cope with stress? Why are they being written? Because we are suffering, that's why. And we're suffering the effects of our time. There's nothing we can do to change it. Uh, but I think the artists could begin to try to find a more meaningful uh, way of art, bring it back to life, bring it in connection with reality. We'll do, we're going to talk about how to handle some of these things on future programs. Meanwhile, the next picture shows Cubism carried to uh, quite an extreme. Uh, Piet Mondrian, Pete Mondrian, of course, uh, painted in the uh, 1930s, working on pictures like this in the 20s, 30s, until his death in 1944, I believe. Uh, composition with red, yellow, and blue. Mondrian, to me, has always been the example of a man who pulls away from the horror of reality, the horror of war. Uh, at the time of the First World War, his work begins to, even before, begins to become increasingly abstract, more and more uh, non-objective. Uh, he started out as a strong realist, but here in this picture, we see him pulling away from reality, creating, in a sense, almost an ivory tower uh, kind of art. He's he was after a dynamism in his painting, but he did not trust reality. He did not trust visual observation. So we see this depersonalization. If Mondrian is one of the most admired artists of the 20th century, then he spawns uh, generations of artists working in this manner. Barnett Newman would not have painted his Station of the Cross that way without the influence of Mondrian, nor would Ellsworth Kelly have painted his five uh, pure color rectangles. Moving to the next picture, uh, we have a modern example of geometric technological structural art. It's, it's called minimal sculpture by Anthony Carroll, painted bright orange, and they're simply beams, structural beams, used for skyscrapers, welded together in various dynamic ways. Uh, going to the next picture, we have a large, you know, these are huge pieces, outdoor sculpture pieces, a sculpture by Tony Smith, uh, approximately 25 feet long. Look at the mechanized qualities of it. It's black, it's painted plywood, but it has a metallic, a harsh, strident, advancing quality. Let's go to the next picture and look at the structure of the Whitney Museum itself, where we uh, notice the similarity between the structure of the Whitney Museum and the, with its cold, harsh, impersonal structure and that of the cold and personal art of Mondrian, of Caro, of Ellsworth Kelly, of Barnett Newman. When we enter this building, if you saw the Whitney Annual, it was a cold, impersonal kind of show. There was simply, uh, if it wasn't impersonal in style with hard edge and sharp corners, it was 
simply experimenting with various techniques. Uh, I've always looked at the Whitney and seen with that overhang, it, it almost is a threat to the viewer. You know, it's almost daring you to walk under those overhangs and be crushed or sliced and diced uh, by those almost guillotine-like shapes. And if this is a house of culture, exemplifying this harsh, impersonal style, uh, I think it, sh it shows why there's so much uh, problem in the arts today, that there's so much of this coldness, this impersonality. So wrapping it up, uh, it's not just a question of art. You know, someone says, well, it's only art. Well, unfortunately, art reflects the consciousness of a people at a given time. And if we are continually dehumanizing ourselves, uh, not only in reality, but by the culture, this where we're trying to uh, supposedly go to the spring to refresh ourselves, and we see the same thing. Uh, we stultify the things that are alive in us and the things that are human in us. Thanks very much. We'll continue this at another time. Bye-bye now.